So because every ingredient in pet food is either food grade or feed grade, there are some things, Steve and I say, try to avoid. So you're going to see some synthetic minerals on the bag that are oxides and sulfates. Those are feed grade minerals. They're cheap. If you can avoid them, do. Now when I say if, guys, it's important that you all know that we're not bashing. You're going to see a ton of brands today. We are not endorsing or bashing any of them. We're using them as examples. And we're using them as examples because Robistro emailed store owners and said, what are your questions? And these are the brands that you had questions about. So we didn't single them out to put a spotlight on them. We're not trying to do, we are not doing defamation to anyone. We're talking about labels and ingredients so that you have a better awareness. So meals, meat meals, pork meal, chicken meal, beef meal, Meals are only feed grade. There's, you can't go to your local grocery store and buy chicken meal for your kid. It's only animal grade. And last but not least, byproducts. Now, there are some byproducts that are flipping amazing, like pancreas. I wish pancreas as a byproduct was put into every pet food because we would not have pancreatitis. We would not have belchy, farty, gassy dogs and cats. Dogs and cats are meant to eat a bunch of pancreas and all of their prey, and no one feeds it. The problem is the reason we don't like byproducts is there's no regulation. So along with your healthy pancreas, you get abscesses, tumors, disease tissues, which we're out on. And because there's no delineation, right now, until regulation change, we say, generally speaking, be a little cautious. Sadly, sadly, be a little cautious of byproducts. Things you can say yes to are proteinate and chelate minerals, as well as things that are labeled as human edible. That's another term for human grade that you'll see on some websites. So as an example, again, Steve and I are not bashing dog chow. In fact, I will say this. If we could empty the shelters today by having dogs eat and dogs and kitties eat prenup dog chow, we would do it in a second. In a second. We would rather have every dog and cat being adopted eating this the rest of their life than not being adopted. So we'd rather have you own an animal and feed it the best food you can afford to feed than not own an animal. So don't have any shame or any guilt about the fact that if this is where you're at, we have a whole other seminar where we can teach you how to make this food better. So don't feel guilty or have anyone shame you if this is all you can afford. Do you need to be aware of what's in the food? You do, so that you can detox when you're done feeding it. <laughs> OK, so when we look at this label, this is by weight. So whole grain corn is number one. When I talked about unidentified meat, this is meat, meat and bone meal. That means on some lots it's chicken, some lots it's beef, some lots it's horse. It's whatever that meat and bone, whenever they buy from the Renders Association, if you were to do DNA testing on this food, batch to batch, it would be like the rainbow. It'd be every species of everything you can imagine. That's partly how euthanasia solution got into the pet food supply. Euthanize horses. And it went in as, as meat meal and bone meal. It got passed up the food chain. So down here, here's my example of the minerals. You see sulfate, feed grade. S copper sulfate, feed grade. So your question should be like, well, what's the big deal? I mean, what's the problem with copper sulfate? It's in all of my pet food. So this is a wiki. This is my slide. You can tell it doesn't move and super boring. <laughs> it's also a wiki page. I want you to read this. Copper sulfate was used as a emetic. That means it makes things puke. And look down here. Because of its irritating effects on the GI tract, you need to induce vomiting. So we're using this as a mineral nutrient, but it causes GI irritation. This alone, me having my clients that come in with IBD, sensitive stomach, chronic pukers, just eliminate the feed grade minerals. And in about 25% of the cases, guess what? The vomiting and diarrhea stops. Shocking, but true. So I want you to remember that nutrients come from two sources. They come from synthetics, which means lab-made vitamins and minerals that are separated into feed grade, super cheap. Steve's going to cover that in a little bit later. And human grade nutrients, which are four to 10 times more expensive. They are so expensive. In fact, it's the most expensive piece, oftentimes, of pet food, is human nutrients used to balance the recipes. The vast majority of fresh foods, so you can get your nutrients from synthetics, the vast majority of fresh foods, we try and get the bulk of our nutrient intake for our pets from real, whole, healthy food. So there are two options, powders or real whole, real whole healthy foods. And I show you this slide because when you're looking at a bag of pet food, I want you to see when the food stops, the last ingredient of food, and then where the synthetics start. And that tells you some idea of how much of this 
food, how much of the nutrition coming into my dog or cat is coming from man-made powders versus real healthy food. Okay, so there are purpose for additives. Meeting minimum nutrient requirements is a big one, but stabilization, preservation, you know, for, for shelf-stable foods, we have to get two to three year shelf life minimum, plus processing. To get dogs and cats to eat that food, we use a ton of palatability enhancers. We trick them, we spray fat, restaurant grease, on the outside of kibble to make them eat it. And that's necessary. And then, of course, perception and marketing. So some examples of additives are, oh, sorry. Some examples of additives are synthetic, synthetic amino acids, synthetic vitamins and minerals. We also have dyes and colors, those bright colored kibble is not for the dogs and cats. Those rainbow colors of kibble is not because your dog wants to eat those. It's for you to think you're giving different foods. It's just um, synthetic colors. Emulsifiers, stabilizers, flavor enhancers. And then down here on the bottom are teeny tiny amounts of nutraceuticals, herbs, or extracts, also called superfoods. The vast majority of those, they may be in there in high enough quantity to actually have a medicinal effect, but hands down, honestly, I'm going to show you a ton of examples. They're in there for marketing. And we could, Steve and I could spend six hours today talking to you about marketing. We're not going to. But we could just spend an entire day covering marketing. Now, I'm not opposed, we're not opposed to marketing, but the pet food industry doesn't market honestly. And what I mean by that is when you find salt on the label, for adult pet foods, salt is about 1%. So when you identify salt on the label, you're, I want you to be thinking, OK, that's 1% of what's in the bag. And everything after salt, so for this label, good on this pet food company, they're using proteinate, 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 nice job. But after salt, it's minuscule amounts. So look down here where it says blueberries. Steve, if, if this is 1%, would you say blueberries are like 0.05%? Yeah. 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 So I mean, okay. So when I say homeopathic, I mean like none in there. But here, here's the front of the bag. Okay. So here's the front of the bag. And where are blueberries on the front of the bag? It's a little bit deceptive, right? Like you're like, you know, dang, it kind of looks like there's healthy amount of. Is that me? That's me. Okay. Um, okay. Is. It, it's a little bit deceptive. This is a bag that my client bought because there's cranberries on the front. She bought this bag of food because her dog has recurrent urinary tract infections and cystitis. And so she's like, you know what? I'm, I, I, I've been told that cranberry is good. Well, here's the salt. And down here are cranberries at maybe 0.05%. So part of us learning is us not falling for this. Cranberry is amazing at uh, natural bladder antiseptic. It does a great job of moderating urinary pH, but not at homeopathic amounts. So how did AFCO come up with their minimum nutrient requirements? Well, um, AFCO took the lead from NRC, which is the National Research Council. And the, natural Res the National Research Council is a group of scientists, PhDs, nutritionists that from 1946 until 2006, which is, which is the last time they updated their findings, they are the people that did not ethical but necessary research where they take whole litters of puppies and kittens and deny them selenium, grow them up, sacrifice them, and see what happens. Whole litters and denying them iodine. We're able to know precisely what happens when you deny animals nutrients. We know that. We don't have to run those god-awful, unnecessary experiments in our own kitchens anymore. We don't need to do that. It's been proven. They're unethical experiments, and I don't feel we need to do it again. So what that means is veterinarians are pretty stickler about meeting minimum nutrient requirements. And you'll hear people say, oh, it's a bunch of hogwash, and AFCO's a bunch of hogwash. AFCO's got a lot of problems, a lot of political problems. And who likes politics? Well, no one. So. AFCO has its fair share of problems, but meeting minimum nutrient requirements, there is no argument from scientists that that has to happen. Now, whether you do it with synthetics or real food, whether it's appropriate, all those questions are up for grabs. But what we don't have any argument about is what's necessary to keep an animal alive. And that's the point that it's very important for you to understand. 
But when we look at minimum nutrient requirements, foods are understandable. We know what foods are when we look at the label, but there are some words that are a little bit spooky. So sodium selenite is synthetic selenium. Menadione is synthetic vitamin K. Inulin is an awesome prebiotic fiber that comes from chicory, but it, this looks like a scary word. Ascorbic acid sounds spooky. It's vitamin C. B vitamins, I'll show you in a minute. Ethylene diamine is iodine. And tocopherols are vitamin E. So when you see tocopherol in the bag, you think that looks like a chemical. It's the, it's the chemical name of vitamin E. The B vitamins are even worse. Thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, pentothenic acid, pyroxidine, folic acid. Look, cyanocobalamin sounds like cyanide. It's B12. So the B vitamins are actually, you see these on the label and you're like, oh my gosh. I used to say you have to be able to pronounce every ingredient on the label. I don't say that anymore because I can't pronounce these. But they're safe, they're in there, they're synthetic. They're in there because they, the manufacturer opted not to use foods that contain the bees or high heat processing, they were in there. And because of high heat processing, the average bag of kibble is heated four times before you crack it and feed it. B vitamins above 120 degrees, they're gone. So it was, uh, you know, there, there's no reincarnation in the pet food industry. So they're long gone. So the synthetics are sometimes have to be added in. There are two synthetics that Steve and I believe should not be in pet food. The first one is sodium selenite. Sodium selenite, according to uh, human information, can cause GI symptoms, nausea, but with repeated exposure can cause nervous issues. But most importantly, long-term small amount of exposure causes liver and kidney damage and can be immunogenic. It can cause changes in the DNA. So we're not fans of sodium selenite. The second additive we don't recommend is vitamin K3 called menadione. Menadione is a feed grade source of vitamin K. It's called vitamin K3. It is not approved for human consumption. Menadione supplements are banned in the U.S. for people because of their toxicity. But we put them in pet food. So Steve and I believe there are safer, better choices for vitamin K. Don't use menadione. So, sorry about the speed of this. The Linus Pauling Institute has this to say about menadione, that vitamin K1 supplement is safe, vitamin K2 supplement is safe, but vitamin K3, which is menadione, actually interferes with glutathione in your pet's body, which means glutathione is a cellular antioxidant that helps scavenge free radicals, slows down aging, and is critically important. And this synthetic form of vitamin K prevents glutathione from working in your pet's body. So Steve and I would say, why would you use it when there's safer choices? They use it because it's cheap. 